Hey, look at me, it's Randall Lobb. I'm here for the cover price definitive interview for Tales from the Flipside. And you might say, what is that? It's comic thinking, comic reading, comic collecting, and now comic interviews all coming together in some kind of amazing transformative creature. And we are lucky today for our first one to have the writer, creator, and fellow filmmaker who's making a comic that a lot of people are talking about, including us right here in the station right now at Faux Pop Station. We're here with Kyle Higgins, writer and creator of Radiant Black. Kyle Higgins. How's it going? Thanks so much it's, for having me. It's going great. Thank you for taking the time. You're on the West Coast. We're in yep. the East, but somehow we've made this work. It's the, the minor miracles of technology. Uh, well, and yet, what would we do? And yet, we're able to solve that conundrum, but uh, I'm staring at my face with a delay. <laughs> so I've, I've, I've conveniently uh, put a little window, uh, a, a, like, like a note over the window, so I'm not yeah. looking at it, because otherwise I'll start talking yeah. like this. And, yeah. You'll get sucked into some kind of tesseract and go backwards into yourself? I hope. My, that yeah. great. my secret is I look at the camera, but sometimes when I'm out of sync, I do feel myself like looking over yeah, at me. Feel, yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. So for <laughs> people who don't know, um, and they should, tell us a little bit about Radiant Black and why it's, it's in the news even this past week, the last few days for a number of reasons. So can you catch up the people who are foolish enough not to buy one and two? Well, um, so Radiant Black is a, uh, a creator-owned series that I do at Image Comics uh, with uh, Marcelo Costa, who is my co-creator and uh, uh, he's, he's my artistic collaborator. Um, I write the words, he does the pictures. Uh, Michael Basudel, uh is our editor and Becca Carey is our fantastic letterer. And the book is very much a um, kind of... <sighs> It's been, been marketed as uh, a superhero series for a new generation. Um, I was really interested in exploring kind of a millennial reinvention of something like, you know, like the Spider-Man archetype and intermixing um, some different influences that I have and some different genres and subgenres that I quite enjoy, um, along with uh, some personal kind of... Um, experiences that have certainly shaped uh, who I am. And, and honestly, uh, it's just writing about the stuff that terrifies me at two o'clock in the morning when I wake up and suddenly, you know, can't get back to sleep. Um, so it, the, the book opens with um, a 30 year old uh, gentleman named Nathan Burnett in uh, the city of Los Angeles. And it's the most existentially terrifying splash page I've ever written. It's a, it's a shot of his phone with, the, with his bank account balances. And it's like uh, $46.98 in a checking account and $38,000 of credit card debt. And so Nathan, uh, and then there's a word balloon coming from the phone. And it says, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Burnett, but unfortunately, your loan application has been denied. And so within like four pages, he's moving back in with his parents in Illinois. Um, and that's uh, that's all before he finds the miniature black hole that gives him a very kind of uh, tokusatsu uh, inspired transformation sequence and uh, a super suit and some powers and uh, perhaps a uh, a new way to do something meaningful um, in his life. Um, uh, it's I not to say that he. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no. You go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, it's not to say that he would um, give up writing, but, um, you know, uh, sometimes I was, I was a big basketball player for most of my life. And there was always a, a saying about like, if you, if you had gone cold, like you were on a, a cold, like you were having an off night shooting, sometimes just seeing the ball go through the hoop kind of unlocks things for you. Like, so just an easy shot or a layup, you know, or a free throw, just that simple act of like, oh, I'm associating now this action and it worked kind of, you know, you, you, it, it can kind of open things up. And, um, 
that may 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 or may not be the case here for Nathan as uh, the the next issue uh, issue three, which will be out um, this week uh, on Wednesday, is called Writing Day, and it's a day in the life of Nathan uh, trying to work on his novel. Uh, but we can get to that kind of you know down the line here. Uh, I, I apologize. I feel like I I I, I, I cut you off as I uh, no as I as I stare at the camera without. <laughs> Oh no, no, I'm still there. <laughs> you're not. You're not cutting me off. Uh, I'm here to. I'm here to try and pull out of you all the work so I can sit back and listen. Uh, <laughs> I, I found it. I'm obviously post millennial. Post millennial. I'm Gen X. I'm an old man. I got gray hair. I got a gray back. I'm like an old gorilla that's running around, <laughs> still beating his chest. And I am like so invested from that first page because I know that feeling. Yeah. I mean, listen, we don't have to play personal versus personal. I, too, am a writer. I, too, have looked at the blinking cursor that we see in a later issue. I, I right. know the feeling. And what I like is, and Clint here producing, he's saying the same thing. He knows the feeling of, you know, diminished expectations at times. Do you move back home? Do you, how do you address your debt? What other issues yeah. have accrued? But you've studied it into the most relatable version of that story, the driving for a company like a Lyft or an Uber or whatever, and just the anonymity of being that guy. And we've all, by the way, got in that car. And right. if we're not an asshole, maybe we think about that person, you know? I've jumped in an Uber with a chemical engineer from Lahore or somewhere, you know, in the Middle East, and he's here driving an Uber, but he's a chemical engineer and he doesn't have the money for the tests. And, you know, I thought yeah. about that. You really hit on so much of that angst that maybe a creative would feel or a millennial would feel naturally. Well, certainly, certainly a creative. Um, but, you know, I but also from a generational standpoint, um, you know, I, I think I'm 35 and uh, uh, I remember my I remember my ex used to say, uh, something along the lines. I don't remember where she got it from, but um, if you're old enough to remember walking into a classroom and dying of dysentery on the Oregon Trail on an old Apple II, you're not a millennial. Like, there's this pocket um, that I find myself falling into where, like, we remember before the internet, you know, um, and not all millennials do. Or I guess I don't really quite know how the gener how the the generational kind of determination happens um mm -hmm. but uh because it ends up happening like retroactively sometimes right like mm -hmm. they end up kind of changing the years uh that mm -hmm. qualify for certain um well yeah whatever um but that the reason I, I even bring that up is because um along with coming up um before the internet i think the other thing that like we probably have in common is well, I'm kind of like the last, we are kind of like the last generation that was sold the American dream, you know, like, and by the American dream, I, I, I mean, like, sorry, you know what, maybe the American dream is not the right term there. It's more the path, the path forward of like, what you're supposed to do, like, you, you, you know, you go to, you, come, you graduate from high school, and, and you, you go to college, and, um, if you're able to, and, and then you come out of college and you get married, you get a, a job that's a career you're at for 20 years mm -hmm. and you get married and you have kids and you get a fan and you have a house and like all of these things that, you know, my parents did. And, and, um, it, it, it's not like that anymore, you know? It and, sure um, isn't. yeah. And, and, and yet I do feel like there is a part of me that still has that deep inside uh, like a voice that is saying like, well, you haven't really done shit, man. Like you don't, you like you have an apartment and you live alone with a cat and you, 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 you write comic books, you know, and I love comic books, but it is like, there is that little voice because of, um, for me, where I, I was, where I grew up, but also when I grew up. And, um, that's interesting to me to, you know, explore, um, you know, my friend, one of my best friends has a, has a 21 year old, uh, son, which blows my mind because I, I still think he's 12, you know, but 
his relationship with technology and the internet, much less expectations and um, the ideas of, of career paths is quite a bit different than, than um, you know, my relationship or, or feelings on, on some of that stuff and other people kind of my age as well. And so that's all kind of a long winded way of saying, like, I was really interested in, in diving into like stuff that we don't really talk about that much um, as far as um, how we quantify um, success or, or even just personal um, achievement or growth um, or just self-worth. And that to me is what I'm, you know, that that's really the heart and kind of like the emotional core of, of this series for me. And it's going to apply across the board to every character that we bring in um, in different points of view and, and more, um, you know, we have, we have, well, I don't want to spoil too much, but no, don't. we have some new characters coming up and some new um, stories and subplots. And, and, you know, it's going to become a little bit more of an expansive cast here as it would have to, it's, you know, it's an ongoing series. But um, I, I just, sometimes I, I find, you know, the, I think the best science fiction is allegorical, but I think the best superhero stories are, um, are, are, are very timely. And uh, I was really interested in, in, I was really interested in building a superhero series that didn't feel like um, what you would expect a superhero series to be. Well, what I was gonna say is what I like is it's a spin on the 62 Spider-Man story, right? It's, if you want, that was an actual cat's tail. Like you are living the oh. life. That was real. Oh yeah, no, my I live with like he's like Jaws. Like you're gonna see him. He just like <laughs> he just paces on my keyboard. Yeah, I love it. Uh, I'm also a cat <laughs> owner, so I'm in no position to judge. But what I like is if you look at 62 Peter Parker. But by the way, we all know that when you're building comics, you're dealing with tropes and structures and formats, and there are a lot of things that have to get welded on here. You're a screenwriter as well, I know. So you have a set of tools that you kind of have to use. You can play around with them, which you do in that third episode or issue, which I love. Um, and, and we can talk about that in a minute. But this idea of, you know, what's going to happen to our hero on his or her turn? And, and Clint right. and I were talking about this beforehand. He's like, man, it was so fast, like suddenly, there's the superhero, which I, I loved, and he was expecting the timeout to be a little different, right? It would come a little later in the, you know, it would maybe at the end of the issue. So that the Oh, you're episode, saying like issue one? Yeah, I think he might have been thinking that the last panel is the reveal. Oh my God, now this is me. Like that's the classic right. turn in a comic, right? And well, conversely though, it's interesting you say that because um, there is an argument that can be made that um, it should be way, way, way sooner than I than we're doing it. Screen you know, writing. like, is it a, it's a superhero book? Why are there no superheroes in it? You know, for the first half, and well, um, yeah, that's a conscious choice. You know, like I, that's just that's why I wanted. You know, the the first splash page of issue one and the final splash page of issue one are mirror images, and that is not yes. a coincidence. No, so, um, or I guess inverse, uh, like a like an inverse mirror dark mirror whatever pick your pick your uh, your description your description we, we, we can use the metaphor of choice a wicked witch mirror that shows you the other side of the thing you're looking at or the other the inverted world of stranger things what sure. i liked about it is i like like i can feel the screenwriter in you you know x number of minutes into the screenplay we got to have that spin and so someone my age i've read thousands of comics potentially i've seen however many movies and shows i'm looking for things to follow certain patterns or to conform to structures and when you have him vomit the first thing that he does when he gets the suit is vomit i'm like okay this guy gets me he is giving me surprises and the fact that the suit creates you know a way that he can vomit i just thought that was so yes. awesome and the way his buddy interacts with it that's really smart so i was really impressed you're welding these things together in a way that I wasn't ready for. And you would be surprised, you know, if you're this age to find Thank something you. that's surprising. Thank you. I mean, that, that's been the interesting thing about the book and the reaction of the book so far, um, for me anyway. It's like, 
it the reaction kind of has has spanned the gamut like and it, they're kind of it's like very like like polar extremes it's like um there 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 are you know there are some people going like i do not get this book like this is nothing happens you know um and then there's the side that for me like that's kind of the point where it's like we all know the conventions of superhero storytelling and um you know like <laughs> that that stuff and how to subvert it and how to do something new with different influences um in in the uh, well, hopefully something new i mean that's that's the goal um is challenging but that's really exciting to me and oh uh, shoot i just lost my train of thought hold on i had it i had it um do you want me to push back on something that you said to get you back into this mind space no, no, no. Hold on. My cat distracting me. Um, kid, come on. He's eating. He just, he always does this when I'm on Zooms. Um, yeah, of course. No, no, no. Hold on. What were we just saying? We were saying... Subverting uh, some of the tropes and, and taking risks with these subversions. Maybe you're wondering, is it still going to be relatable to people looking for those elements? Oh, um, yeah. Like, I was... Oh, I remember what I was going to say. Yeah, like... We all know the tropes. We know the, the conventions of superhero storytelling. And so what for me is most interesting is finding ways now to um, either subvert or at the very least um, bring in uh, some, some more different and unique um, influences to try to do something new. And as a part of that, like, for example, as I started issue one, and I'm writing the scene where the you know the cops show up and, and there's the train situation. Exactly. Et I found myself with a choice, and it's like, well, the standard way to go here is that uh, like this is the first extraordinary thing that they've seen in the world. But I think probably the most unrealistic thing, actually, Matt Groom, who writes uh, Inferno Girl Red. Uh, which is the Kickstarter that's uh, going on right now. Um, we're actually fully funded and, and into our stretch goals, and it's just, it's killing it. Um, I'm editing the book, and, and Matt's writing it with Erica Duroso, uh, De Urso drawing and uh, Igor Monti coloring and Becky Perry lettering. Um, Matt had a, made, said something a few weeks ago that, uh, that I laughed at because he, he completely nailed it. The most unbelievable thing about a new superhero in the year 2021 is the idea that anyone wouldn't know what a superhero is. <laughs> like, we are inundated culturally across the board, um, pop culture-wise, uh, even, even just all of our entertainment is so superhero-dominated now. And I found myself in that moment going like, well, wouldn't it be interesting if, like, do... The cops straight up at, I think the, the exact wording is like, is he wearing a costume? Is your friend wearing a costume? But like, in my mind, it's like, uh, is, this, is this dude cosplaying? Like, superheroes should be a part of um, the backdrop of something like Radiant Black, you know? Um, and so there's references in issue two to like Marvel movies. Um, there's mm -hmm. a straight up reference to Marvel comics in issue three um, and also Power Rangers. You know, and, mm -hmm. and that to me is like we, we, you know, we live in a we live in a meta modern kind of era now where. Yeah, it's post post modern. Like post post modern. Is that what we're technically in? Yeah. I don't know what yeah. we call it. I like meta modern, I, I, I think, or recursive post modernism, if you could even get back into the tail that you're swallowing of your own. Yeah, yeah. The way that you interrupt the trope with the cops. I thought that was so smart. Like to me, surprise, surprise, <laughs> the surprise of the cops. First of all, I mean, I don't want to get this is not fan service. I want to dig deeper into this, but I do have to say what I really appreciate is we know the best buddy, the guy who knows more about you than you do. Like everybody knows right. that best buddy. But this best buddy has some of the worst attributes of a typical American asshole, right? Like a smug right. prick. and. Like, okay, he's Quentin Tarantino, in effect. He's like an annoying, I, I, so I'm getting that. But then his reaction to the cops and the way the cops deal with him, I thought, fuck, these cops are postmodern. Like, they're in on it as well. 
and yeah. how that plays out, right? I, I really like that, how you keep moving that along. And again, it's just surprise after surprise. And this idea that uh, it's not so much that they know about comics, it's that they know about knowing about comics, or that's what it feels like right. to me. Yeah, 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 we know this. They're not surprised. Right. That's, they're almost ready yeah. for this. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, look, there are some things that are going to be coming up soon uh, that we'll be, we'll be talking about uh, in the not too distant future. Mm -hmm. um, as far as what the state of the world uh, or, uh, you know, dare I say, universe, uh, as it relates to superheroes, uh, that Image Comics looks like. So, you know, there's Savage Dragons out there and Spawns out there and yeah. Radiant Blacks out there. And I don't know, maybe there's some other stuff that's going to be out there as well. Like uh, Inferno Girl Red is now, uh, now that it's fully funded, um, we, it's weird. I mean, we said this in the Kickstarter, we'll be doing the soft cover edition uh, with Image. And, you know, part of our reward tiers included a... Uh, a team up print of mm. Radiant Black and Inferno Girl Red that Erica and Marcelo collaborated on, and you know it's not, it's not a, uh, it's not exactly a coincidence that that we're doing that and and that we are uh, uh, that we debuted the project in the back of Radiant Black in the first place, you know. Yeah. Um, so there's going to be a lot of I, there's I shouldn't say I shouldn't say a lot but I, I should say that there are going to be some opportunities I think to um, to push uh, to push the genre forward a bit um, well, and the really cool thing about doing anything at image is that the creators control and own everything yeah. so if you want to and th I'm not saying this with any um, malice or disrespect to, towards Marvel and DC whatsoever, but you know I'm I'm, I'm uh, I still do work there occasionally. I'm doing Ultraman for Marvel right now, um, but if you really want to do something new and you really want to try to change things um, or explore new territory uh, of a very well trodden genre, um, I do think that. Uh, a creator-owned book is kind of the only real way to do it, um, because those care. Well, the, the coolest thing about image characters that people don't talk about is, I mean, the, Savage Dragon and Spawn aged in real time for quite a long time. I mean, I, Savage Dragon might still be in real time. I mean, Dragon's dead. It's the son that's in the book, and you could only do that with a creator-owned series. You know um, what yeah. Robert and. And Corey Walker and um, Ryan Otley did with Invincible is the gold standard of modern superhero storytelling, as far as I'm concerned, because that book went wherever they wanted to take it to explore subject matter, whatever subject matter that they wanted. And using the genre that we all or a lot of us love being superheroes as the vehicle and vessel to do it. Um, and, you know. I think to your point about, I've read a lot of comics too. You know, I've read comics my whole life. I've read superhero comics specifically my whole life. And so to find something new, um, and I'm not saying Radiant Black is that uh, for me, you know, like, but maybe it is for someone else. Um, it will that, be. Like, that's the swing worth taking. And that's, that's really what influences kind of, has influenced all of our decisions as we've been building, uh, building this out. I think you can feel that the the universe is uncertain. Uh, like reading forward again, I'm a Marvel DC image. Boom, you name it, I'll read it. I don't care if it's good. I like it. It doesn't matter. But when you're reading some of the DC and Marvel marquee titles, the universe is very powerful, and it it actually is an impingement to some of the possibility that this is not revolutionary. What I'm saying, it's obvious, but the rules are often committee rules. You're a filmmaker, you know what it's like. When a committee gets its hands on an IP or a story or a character, there are a lot of barriers that come up that we have to think about the action figures, we have to think about the possibilities. And, and, and with a lot of these creator-owned titles like yours, 
we're reading into darkness. We don't know. You have a lot of power here that is outside of the rules of reading of comics. And that was exciting and, for me. And hold on, J just to piggyback off that, because I because you just nailed it as far as I'm concerned. I think that's actually a really, really important point. Because what is the greatest adage of modern superhero storytelling? What happens when you have that great power? Great responsibility. As far as we're concerned, if we weren't, if we were not determined to take really, really big swings, we would be, um, we would be uh, doing a disservice to um, the opportunity and the responsibility that uh, that is there. As far as I'm concerned. And, and so 100%. issue three is a wildly different issue. Issue four blows it out of the water and it changes everything. Dude, issue three was really surprising to me. Yeah, but issue four, I mean, we can get into three, uh, but y you know that, um, how do I want to put this? Uh, you, know, uh, you know that little book uh, that I just mentioned that is now a, a really amazing Amazon Prime series, Invincible? Yeah. And you know how there's that twist uh, pretty early. Yeah. Um, Robert has said he wishes it would have been earlier, you know, yeah. uh, but uh, that happened around issue seven. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's great. Hmm. But I think it's even better if I do it at issue four. Well, this is going to be surprising. I, I like that idea <laughs> that some of the channels that are available uh, mm -hmm. to us, to you as a writer, to me as a reader, some of the channels are unknown. And I like picking, I, I read almost every number one. Anything that comes out, I want to read a number one. I want that feeling. Yes, I'm going to read a lot of Batman. Yes, I'm going to probably pick up some Wolverines over the years and a whole bunch of different stuff. But you know, when Department of Truth comes out, did I say it right? Department of Truth? I feel like I said the wrong title. Something is Killing Children, those Tinian titles, when those come out, yeah. when Radiant Black comes out, or when Moonshine or whatever, uh, Southern Bastards. Did I say the name right? I'm getting all the names wrong yeah. now. When those come out and I pick them up and I don't know what's going to happen, I'm more excited than Punchline and Batman. No offense to Batman or Punchline or Tinian for that. It's when I don't know where it's going that it right. pulls me in deeper. And I know that you're thinking that when you're writing this. I can tell. Yeah, I mean, there's. Um, by the way, I should I should probably clarify that uh, Nathan's father is not going to try to kill him in issue four. Uh, <laughs> the spirit of <laughs> the you know seismic kind of twist. Um, but uh, uh, let, let me interrupt yeah. your thought to say one thing about Nathan's dad. I like yeah. what you did with Nathan's dad. Those quiet moments sometimes are pretty throwaway in comics, right? right? But the the way that you play those out, that feels, A, super realistic. I'm a dad of a 22-year-old, but I'm also a kid who was a dad of, you know, that generation. Yeah. And I know that feeling. And it is complicated. And it's not simplistic. And it's not just automatic asshole because he's the dad. I really like that. I like that you're... Yeah, You've created a room. I've become, I've become more comfortable with two things as I've gotten older and gotten older as a writer. Um, the the first is uh, is is optimism, um, and and the <laughs> second is ambiguity. And I think that when you're starting out um, as any sort of, uh, especially in fiction, uh, storyteller, I think there's a tendency. Um, and it definitely happened for me uh, to want everything to be like clockwork. You want mm -hmm. your plotting to be, you know, something that would make Christopher Nolan, uh, you know, uh, smile. Right. You would, <laughs> you want you want to show up because there is so much of a of a uh, insecurity there that you have and an imposter syndrome. And um, and I think what ends up happening is you a lot of writers or I'll just speak for myself, you, you tend to start prioritizing, um, you know, the, some of the, some of the plotting and mm -hmm. plot, look, plotting is incredibly important. Like, don't get me wrong. And, and I don't agree with people who say it's not, um, but plotting is not a story. Um, you know, plotting with your characters is plotting to get your characters to somewhere interesting is what makes for a story. Um, and so for me, the stuff with the dad, with, with Nathan's father, 
Um, at no point does he actually say, uh, at no point does he actually say like, hey, you shouldn't do this. You shouldn't write. Mm-hmm. But you know, I tried to approach it in a way where just because he didn't say that doesn't mean Nathan didn't hear it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so in the end, when he's like, yeah, I think you should do this. And he's like, wait, but I thought it's like, yeah, and, no, and then it's interrupted by the oatmeal moment. Um, but that to me is like, I don't know that I would have written that scene. I wouldn't have written that scene when I was writing at DC. I can tell you that, you know, I, I, I think it, you want it to be way more buttoned up and, and yeah. you know, be able to, to uh, survive the editor who doesn't understand what mm-hmm. you're going for is note of like, well, but you know, this is a lot of talking and what's uh, you know, what's going on here. And it's like, you know, uh, I, That's we, just what I was going to say. They think it's what fat. Think or, what's that? They think it's fat. Yeah. I mean, I had, I, I literally had an editor that I worked with um, and I quite liked this editor uh, as, as a person, but um, we didn't, we didn't work very well together and, and I was very new in my career. But um, when I was doing new 52, like all the nightwing stuff, you know, I would get these notes where it's like, well, you know, Kyle, there's, you have three pages of dialogue scenes in a row. That's just too many. And it became this like quota of like, and then in the dialogue scene, it's like, well, you know, there's just not really dynamic. So like, can the clown be juggling while they, while he talks to, to Dick Grayson, you know? And it was just stuff like that, you know? And uh, um, yeah, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and look, it, on the one hand, it's, it's, it's interesting because, the note behind the note, I understand and appreciate much more, especially now. Like I, I get what they meant, you know. But when you're in it, it's like this is not. This just feels like a checklist of how to how to make a competent comic. You know, it doesn't think feel like it, it allows be, for anything to be different, unique, slash potentially if it's unique enough. It would great. be easy for them to forget, like they're subsumed with format, right? They might be editing multiple titles and the format is really what they have to focus on. So they forget about me at home, maybe reading it on paper, maybe reading it on an iPad, what have you, and sitting in the moment differently. I'm in a different place and I get, you know, my place as a reader is closer to your place as a writer than it is to the editor sitting there, isn't it? Like we are much more in simpatico than the editor would be, no offense to the editor. Yeah, well, and also tastes change um, depending on what era you're talking about. And, you know, we went through an era of, of pretty extensive decompressed storytelling in comics, especially superhero comics, I should say. Um, you know, when Bendis was, was really kind of coming up, and I love Brian's work, um, I, I just mean from, from a taste standpoint, like everything got very decompressed in those kind of like, like, I don't know, early to mid 2000s, right? Mm-hmm. And then right around the time, of the, starting with the New 52, I remember like, I was pitching doing like, you know, it's a seven issue arc. And they're like, no, it's not. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, no, you're gonna do this in four. And it's like, cause seven issues is seven months. It's a long time. Mm-hmm. And, and things were starting to change as far as, um, I think, um, tastes for, for, types of storytelling and and uh or at least that's what it seems like looking back and maybe giving the benefit of the doubt there you know but um so uh, you know so there's that and so so that is sometimes where where an editor might be more in tune than than the writer is but even that i you know i, I don't know i don't know i, I think I, I think i agree with you that well the relate look the relationship between the writer and in the case of comics, the writer slash artist and the um, and the letter as well mm-hmm. and the reader, if you do it right, can be incredibly direct. Um, I think probably the purest like one to one relationship is is with prose because there's no safety net. There's no visuals. There's no nothing. It's 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 your words. It's black ink on white paper. And that's it. In comics, we get we get a little bit more tools to work with um for interpretation i should say uh but it is still like you know you look at you look at something like saga and it's alchemy it's just it's magic like 
what Brian writes is fantastic, but again, it is words in a bubble. But it's that word in the bubble next to that Fiona illustration mm -hmm. that it becomes something much more. For and me, that is, in that case, a, such a direct one to one to um, to readers that it, it's hard to capture that. Um, but if you can, then you have a you have a book like Saga. <laughs> For me, this Radiant Black comes out, and again, I I don't know the artist Marcelo very well. Uh, uh, I'm looking at this work, and what's funny is, I'm picking it like a movie. Like I'm I'm reading it like a film and the, the decision making that the artist is using feels to me until that third issue where you get into the mixed media which I loved by the way I really like that but I realized I'm not reading this like a comic like the art is invisible I don't know if that was a decision but it, it, it sort of disappeared and I'll use the example of in the third episode you know the car the people that are having the car trouble the yeah. car is a car. It's not stylized, right? Like it's, it, it feels like a weird, I don't know. There, there is some alchemy that happens where the comic kind of fades away and I'm just yeah. seeing the story. Do you see what I'm saying there with this? I mean, that's, so that's the thing. Like that's what we are chasing. Like that's what we are constantly every month, every day trying to touch. We're trying to touch the hem of this, ethereal um thing and um it's almost like this ethereal of, like effect that uh you can have on on an audience or on readers and i remember um i remember like probably like six years ago now i was doing batman beyond uh 2.0 for dc and and um my my editor uh who i love uh alex antone sent me like the proof of the um the first collected edition right and so the way that the book worked at that time was like they were uh, it was a digital first so i was writing 10 page stories that were turned in 20 screens so i would write these dense pages um when they were printed it was like man for especially <laughs> the first arc like really dense like 10 panel pages you know because they were just like cr they were just cutting a page and half, uh, I'll do it on the screen, a page and half horizontally. And so the top half became one, you know, iPad screen, basically, and the bottom half became another iPad screen. So you essentially are getting 20, you know, storytelling wow. pages out of 10 pages of art. And but for me, it's like, well, I'm not going to write a 10 page story, I'm going to write a 20 page story. And so the first kind of arc was um, eight chapters. And the second arc was eight chapters. And so those together form the equivalent of eight issues. 16 chapters formed about eight issues, and that was the first volume. And it was this really interesting um, experience of flipping through it because I hadn't looked at it since it had come out uh, in the digital format, you know, probably six months earlier or something like that. And I was looking at volume one, and I was like, oh, my God, this is so overworked. Like, this is so stiff. Like, why is this not... It's just not yeah. quite, and I could tell, it's like, oh, I, I really kind of like, I really overworked it, you know, like over, not over punctuated, but like, I have a term, I don't know if I'm allowed to swear on this or not. But, you are. So I call it uh, uh, comma fucking. So yep. it's like, oh, I really comma fucked that. Like, yeah. you, you, you like, you're so trying to make it perfect that you kind of like overwork everything that was interesting about the idea out of it. And it's functional, and, and the moves narratively are, I stand by, but when you look at it, it's like the alchemy isn't there. You can see all of the, the parts. It's no longer a sum, it isn't a sum of a part. It doesn't add up. And then into volume two, I had started writing more half page splashes, which turned into an entire screen, but it also meant in print that top half was one panel and the bottom half had four or five, right? And so that started to open things up more. And, and we also changed colorists and the artist kind of found his footing a little bit stronger. And, and, and I, um, I was then able, like, I also noticed in just the balloons, like, oh, I was, I was, I was doing a lot less dialogue. I was, I was ballooning less. And I was letting things mm. breathe more. 
And all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, this is, this is working. And it was this weird kind of like out of body experience because normally, you know, you look at your, your own stuff and you see all the things that you were thinking or doing or mm -hmm. at the time, but enough stuff was going on and had, had been going on and there was enough kind of craziness swirling that when I, I, you know, I just, I had this kind of like very objective look at it. Um, and so, uh, for, for radiant black, like that has stuck with me for years. It's like, how do I not, how do I avoid that? How do I not make that mistake again? You know? And, and my power rangers run, um, especially when I got to shattered grid and I started working with Daniele DiNicolo, that's the first time it was like, Oh man, like this is really something like we're really in sync. And, um, it, it, there's, there are some moments that we created together that, um, I, I, I still get goosebumps if I flip through it. There's a double page spread of all the power Rangers arriving, like at the, you know, basically the end of like the second act of what would be like, you know, the end of, uh, when, when would it be? It'd be like the, like at Helm's deep when the cavalry shows up sort of thing, you know, like they've spent like all these days, like yeah. really just taking it on the chin and then the cavalry arrives. But the way we did it was um, there, they all teleport in. And I remember thinking to myself, like when I was writing the book, it was so funny because um, I, I always, I was really careful how I used the teleportation because I hated how in the show it's like streaks of light. Mm -hmm. You're like, that's not how teleportation works, you know? But in this moment, I was like, I need to bring the cavalry in and I want to give this moment, you know, room to breathe. And I carved out three pages, which is a ton of real estate in an event. And no, four pages I carved out for this moment. Wow. And so it's like, oh, Alpha 5 telling the survivors that they're there because they just escaped this big, huge battle. And they're kind of in the command center licking their wounds. And it's like, oh, they're here. This, you know, a call that had gone out three issues earlier, you know, people have finally, Rangers have responded. And they step outside the command center and they're looking around and they don't see anything. It's like four panels. And then Trini goes, look, and you see these light streaks. Because in the moment, I'm getting goosebumps just talking about it. In the moment, I remember I was sitting at like a, uh, like a coffee shop, like waffle bar for some reason. And uh, I was like, how do I do this? How do I, the teleportation thing? Like, I don't like, <gasps> oh, I know how to do this. Like, now this, the, the, the light streak thing is a feature now, not a bug. And when you turn the page, it's just like a meteor shower of oh, like nice. comets, multicolored comets coming from the sky. And it's a, it's a low angle looking up. We're behind the Rangers as they've stepped out and they're looking to the sky. It's a, just a double page spread, just a single image. And then you turn the page and it's a splash page on a page turn of who, of, of the whole group that teleported in. And Directing. It, you know, but, but Daniele is the one who, I think I, I originally scripted inset panels of reaction shots of our, our rangers mm -hmm. as they're seeing the light streaks, you know, and Daniele messaged me when he said, when he read it, he's like, you know what, man, he's like, I have an image. I, I, I don't think we need those. And he cut them and he showed me the thumbnail. And from the thumbnail, I went, that's going to be the most stunning page that I did my entire time in, on Power Rangers. And, um, and it was, and again, it's like, it's like, it, it very much is like a goosebump inducing moment. Um, and, uh, I'm really, really proud of that because it, that kind of loose that the, 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 um, it's like watching a stand up comedian who seems to just be going on a tirade, mm -hmm. but they're so funny. The reality is they know all those moves mm -hmm. making it look effortless is the real challenge. And, and so with issue three, but also with issue, well, actually every issue, if, if you actually look at the plotting of it, there's a lot of um, really intricate stuff that we're trying to do. And it's like, there's a lot of multi-beat kind of sequences where things come back in slightly different ways or you know, the, 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 the argument with dad in issue two sets up the Uber driver thing. Mm -hmm. We bring the cops back from issue one, but then it's like, well, we need answers. And there's a red one. He finds out about the red one from the cops that they bumped into the night before. Exactly. And then how am I going to find the red one? Well, actually, I have this crazy idea. And so he Uber drives basically in order to find 
you know, to ask passengers all night, like, hey, did you hear about this crazy thing? Gets the lead, fights the guy, the, then loses the, his own car, has to save his own car, and then his reward, it, all of his money problems are over. It's a bag yeah. of cash is right there, you know? And, yeah. and he can't do it. And then the, the payoff of the Uber driver, or the driver driver, um, he made some money doing it. He's like, those, that kind of, I mean, you're, you're a writer, like you get it. Like that yeah. stuff is hard to do. And you can totally. only do it if you have a, a, a creative team and, and, and collaborators that are in sync. And Marcelo and I are, are very, very much in sync. So Listen, it's, 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 le- it's filmic because of those, you know, and, and again, I'm not going to, I, we are going deep, so we're going deep. There are sequences where the background is bokeh, which I love, like it's just a color wash or there's a touch of something. Then there are moments where they're very detailed backgrounds. The character's a little bit stylized. The faces remind me of early Walking Dead designs a little bit, the old Kirkman title, you know. And I'm feeling like the choicing or the choices being made by Marcelo, and again, I don't know Marcelo, but they're very filmic. They're oh. very much... It feels yeah. like directing, and I, I really respond to that. And the performance then is what you focus on, like those scenes yeah. where it's just a bokeh wash in the background. You don't think, why is it orange at night? You know what I mean? Like, none of that is happening. I'm just really on the point of the, the frame, or what I perceive well, to be I'll the point you, of the it's, frame. It's, or, it's orange at night because uh, sodium vapor lighting in <laughs> Illinois is crazy at times. Like, I'm telling you, like, it can go... It can like I've been trying to do orange night skies like since I was on Nightwing and I moved into Chicago. The problem with orange skies at night is that it looks like everything's on fire. Yeah. So if you notice in issue two, um, we we really finally dialed in our sodium vapor uh, look, <laughs> and really into issue three is where it really pops. But it that does. actually came from um, one of my best friends, Brian Buccellato, who's an exceptionally talented writer and and he's a director as well. But he was a colorist for like 20 years. Ah. And so Brian knows, like, he knows what I'm going for. And he's like, it needs more green. Like, it's got it. It's mm-hmm. more, it's because I'm thinking, well, is it more of a yellow thing? He's like, sodium vapor is, and he like walked me through his color, you know, palette choice for sodium vapor when he would color comics as well. And so Marcelo, like, we kind of gave that to Marcelo. And then, yeah, I mean, it's just, um, it's a lot of fun. But but oh. a quick thing, like um, since you don't know any much about Marcelo, like Marcelo's story is 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 incredible. Like Marcelo, I met Marcelo through Eduardo Ferragato, and Eduardo Ferragato came on to Hadrian's Wall, the book I did with Alex Eagle and Rod Reese, to to help out and do some pages when we were like really tight on a deadline. And then from there, I set up Eduardo with Matt Broom, who is now doing Inferno Girl Red. Uh, for his first image book, which I helped put together and walked it to image. Uh, It's called Self Made. Well, Eduardo was going, you know what? I have this friend who's really good with color, like would really love, you know, can he join? And we sent the first few pages. I was like, whoa, like these are really good. And at the time, I remember showing these issues to Daphna Plevin, who was my Power Rangers editor. And she was like, who is this colorist? And um, and she's like, I'm going to steal them. And then she totally did and started. And so Marcelo started coloring issues of Rangers. Then he colored the big soul, of the dragon ah. uh, one shot or uh, OGN that I did, uh, as well as some, some stuff in Shattered Grid. And so I only knew Marcelo like as a colorist. Turns out Marcelo is also an illustrator. Marcelo has not, I don't think he, I think Radiant Black is his first U.S. comic that oh, he yeah? illustrated. Yeah. Does he have a... So he's uh, illustrating and coloring himself, but he's been, he's predominantly been coloring for like the last, I want to say like 10 years. But everyone hmm. who knows him, like every artist, I work with a, a number of Brazilian artists and every <laughs> artist to a person has said to me like, Without even before Radiant Black was even announced, which is when I mentioned what you know, I'm doing something with it, and it's Marcelo Costa. And now they go, he's a really great artist. Like he's a really great artist. And well, um, I just, I just feel so lucky that we found, we crossed each other's paths in such a kind of uh, random way, and it worked out. Sometimes it's a little architecture-y, which I like. 
I like that. The odd, you know, like the water tower, for example, is so articulated or the house, Nathan's house, his parents' house, I guess. Sometimes it just looks so articulated and then there are moments where he backs off. And I like that when yeah. an artist makes those choices. Like, I love Capullo and you mm -hmm. are looking at a Capullo page or, you know, Frank Cho doing his thing and you're like, yeah. oh my God, subsumed with details. It can be absorbing, but it can also be, it, it, I get lost sometimes. Like I'm in the panel so long, but here yeah. it's, it's a real dynamic flow that pulls me through the issue. Well, and I and, and I'm a, I'm a huge um, and it's probably because of the directing background, but also my dad is a photographer, so I, mm. I grew up with visuals, and um, that's a, sorry, that's a really weird sentence. I grew up <laughs> around cameras and imagery, I guess, or or, or sure. a, a focus on imagery, sensitivity. And, um, yeah, yeah, and I drew like through high school and everything. I mean, not very well, but I did. Um, but for me, uh, I, I actually think that when you open a comic book, um, you, it's not the art that you notice first. It's not the line art. It's actually the color. I think your brain actually perceives color mm. first, which is telling you and creating um, a tone and a mood. And then, I mean, it's only like a nanosecond, right? Then you're processing the line work. Um, and sometimes it throws me for a loop because I'll see a comic and I look at it, I was like, oh, this looks awful. And then I realized like, oh no, I'm actually reacting to the color. I'm not reacting mm -hmm. to, the, the line work is quite good. Um, and so if you look at it, but, but that gets into like really interesting territory. And I've learned so much from, from Brian over the years um, of just different styles of coloring um, for different styles of art. And I've made mistakes in the past where, you know, I have an artist who's doing a lot of like, um, you know, they're spotting a lot of blacks and, they're, and they, they have a lot of like hatchwork. Um, and then on top of that, a colorist who has more of a painted style, it just becomes like a mess, you know? Um, Marcelo is really interesting because his art really, his art keeps getting, his pages keep getting, his sequentials keep getting better and better. Like the stuff he just did, he's doing right now in issue four is out of this world. The action stuff in issue four is ridiculous. Um, but even still, it all comes together for him in, in color. And so we're, we're actually looking to bring a colorist onto the book full time because it's just so much work to, for any artist to draw and color themselves on a monthly schedule. But it's been a challenge. Uh, it's been a little bit of a challenging process to find someone because the fit has to be so tight um, because that's how Marcelo's line work, he... Um, you know, that's how he uh, that's how he does his line work is with an eye towards like it's tell. gonna I'm gonna bring it all together with my palettes and with my rendering. You can tell in color. You can tell. Mm -hmm. And you know, again, I'm conscious of the time. I, th I hope we can do this another time. Talk about it again. I do want oh, to wind you up. Yeah. Um, I, I want to just dig back a little bit. Sure. Uh, I like that your letter in issue one. Somebody would, might look at this and go, Power Rangers, hey, that's the Power Rangers guy, and they might call that out. You go, no, 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 I'm gonna call it out. I'm gonna say who I am, here's my story. I think right. that's really smart. I like that. I also liked how personal it was, and it lets us know there's an autobiographical feel. It doesn't have to be true, but it's a feel. So I really liked that. I thought that was nice, you opening your vest a little bit, showing your heart. That was really smart. By the way, smart sounds crass. That was nice. I liked it. <laughs> no, I, I, I appreciate that. I mean, um, yeah, it's look, this book, I mean, uh, that letter says everything. I think, mm -hmm. um, it wasn't really my intention initially. I wasn't quite sure what I was going to write in the back matter. And then I kind of started putting this together and, and, um, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm glad I, I included it. And, um, mm -hmm. You know, it's 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 weird. Like we are we are a product of our experiences, um, good and bad experiences. And um, you know, uh, look, we we all have trauma, and we all have things that we've experienced, and um, and they were incredibly painful. Um, and uh, I think that if that helps at all. 
uh, for me anyway, to, to find a way to uh, explore something uh, meaningful uh, and human, uh, then it, I don't want to say it was worth it because it sucks. <laughs> it sucks well, to go through, you know. I might but, tell um, you, but, you I, know, like, I like our trauma. I like our traumas, by the way. Yeah. I just want to say, when we look back on them, um, there's stories that we tell ourselves to make us feel better about them. The way we talk about them, it's important. And I, I'm glad. Everything, every scar on my body, I'm proud of. I like that it's this way. And I feel yeah. that, that you said the same thing in, in that issue. Yeah, I mean, there's some stuff like... Um there's some stuff that I, I, I put in the, in the letters column. There, there's like one, there's one bit in particular that, um, you know, that still like pings for me that I oh, didn't yeah. want to dive into. Uh, but, uh, yeah, you know, my, there, there's a section in that I only, I'm only saying this cause you brought up the letter, but like, there's a section towards the end of that letter where I talk about, um, you know, starting in comics and, and what that experience was like and, and mm -hmm. wanting to uh, and, and, and needing and, and having to navigate some really complex politics and dynamics. Meanwhile, constantly being terrified of like anything I say, like saying or liking the wrong thing mm -hmm. for fear of um, someone who already doesn't like me uh, treating me even fucking worse. Well, you make the statement, man. You say the line. I looked for the line. You talk about the negative and you say this, you're building a community in this letters page, in the people that like this. You and I talking about it right now, obviously have a lot in common. We're 20 years apart in age, yet you've, you, you know, you've drilled into some, <laughs> well, I look at, you don't look at, uh, it's, I like that. And I liked being pulled into that community. It, it makes me want to collect the title uh, I'm not a Power Rangers guy. I'm the wrong age. I didn't grow up with them. And so I don't have a lot of the common experience of that superhero line. Right. But reading this is very trenchant. It feels very real to me. I appreciate you letting us all into that. You can hear me winding up. I do want to talk to you about this again. I want to read on. I want to know what happens in four. I'm telling everyone to pick up one and two, really dig into three. Clint, you agree. Three is a treat to read. I love the story oh, within good. the story. I know you people are going to say this to you, but it reminds me of some Alan Moore thinking back in the day, giving us a story inside his story. And I mean, I like the layers. That's a, ma yeah. that's a massive. That is a massive compliment. Uh, <laughs> j j even just just as a like, not that it's an Alan Moore thing. Like just just that it like, the idea that like trying to do something that. You know, look, I, we, we approach this this issue and, and for if this goes live before the issue comes out, um, you know, it's issue three is, is kind of like the most ambitious thing I've ever tried narratively, um, because, uh, I, I, you know, I, I was trying to do something a little more literary. Now, nah, literary is not quite the right word. Um, I was really interested and fascinated by and always have been. Um, the uh just the way the creative process works and um how certain ideas can take hold but more importantly how sometimes um getting in touch with um your own sense of self and how you're feeling in that moment can sometimes inspire uh, what you're going through can sometimes inspire um some of the narratives that you are writing you know mm -hmm. um and just just how like so there, so everything in there is it was very very meticulously um, we meticulously tried to plan it. Um, every line is 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 specific, um, and um, it's it's something that I didn't know if it was going to work. Uh, I, I also works. don't I don't I'm not a prose writer. I've been terrified of trying to write prose for years because it's so many words. Um, <laughs> But I decided, you know what, like to me, again, this book is all about taking those big swings. And so um, I'm going to write this story. And, uh, and, and so there's a fictional story. It's not very long. Don't worry. It's, we're not going to make you read a lot of text. Um, but it's this fictional story that Nathan wrote that I wrote for Nathan, basically. Yeah, but it's, it's another hook and runner for me. Like now I want to know what's happening there, right? Like that's, right. to me, that's rich. And... 
it's it's a great idea to to mess with. And by the way, I'm not trying to load you up when I say Alan Moore. We all know Alan Moore is on another level. He's a witch He's a or God, warlock. Yeah. He's a creature from another plane. We're lucky to have read his work. But I thought of that when I read this. And to me, that's it is a compliment that I thought of it. And I thought, oh, I like this, that you're trying that. And by the way, mm -hmm. in the same time that you're doing that, you put a scarf on him when he's carrying the car. I don't know if you yeah. wrote that in. Like, that's so I cute. Did. It's it's so <laughs> it's so puckish to use a Shakespearean term. Uh, it just shows that you have a lot of range. You're playing with a lot of things. I really appreciate it as a reader and as a fellow creator of things. I know that it's hard to shoehorn all the stuff in. I like it. Mission accomplished. Yeah. Um, again, I have to wind up. I'm conscious of the time. I really oh, yeah, appreciate talking to you. Is there anything that you would say that inspires you? Let's go out on that. Like, what would you say you sure. want people to read? What What are you feeling that you kind of get juiced up on that you're putting that energy back in here? What's happening for you that you're reading or listening oh, to? Yeah. Or um, Well, uh, I'm actually, this is not, uh, well, I'm actually rereading Invincible again uh, because mm. I just love the book so much. And it's a book that I didn't read for many years um, for just whatever reason. I'd read like the first volume and then didn't and I always intended to get to it and then just never did. And then actually it was about this time last year that uh, Sean Kirkham, uh, a friend of mine who's at Skybound, um, I reached out to him and was like, hey, like, could I could I buy the hardcovers from you guys? Like, you know, cause I have the first one, but I, I'm, you know, I'm OCD. I want the whole set, you know? Same. And so he, um, he set me up and with them and, and all of a sudden, you know, his box shows up with, you know, 11 or 12, well, yeah, 11 volumes. Cause I had volume one already. So, you know, one through 12. And I basically just devoured that series, um, in like two months, uh, during the beginnings of, of quarantine and lockdown. And um, it was cool. I was, I was, I, you know, I, I was, uh, as I was going, like I was, you know, I text Eric Stevenson uh, sometimes of like, you know, oh, I just got to this thing or, you know, and, and um, cause the thing about Eric, like uh, we, we just, we, we just, we love comics. Like that's the thing. Like we, he, he loves comic books. And so like, I can, you can sit there and have a conversation about, about fantastic four runs and, uh burn or kirby's uh version of the suits and and everything else like and so um so as i'm going through it i'm telling these things i i just realized I, I i said this to him it is so nice to be a fan of something again like i think it's so easy to um it's so easy to to become a little jaded and and certainly tired uh the the stuff that made me happy growing up stories and superheroes and both of those things are my you know they're my career now and so um it's rare when i find something that uh i i'm able to kind of turn off the writer brain and just go for the ride and really enjoy it and invincible is one of those things um i'm reading uh i just read uh the first issue of the silver coin uh the um i'm gonna it's Michael Walsh doing the art. I think Chip Zdarsky wrote it, uh, the first issue, but it's like an anthology series, and I loved it. So that first issue is coming out uh, yeah, pretty Chip soon here. It. Yeah, it was Chip. Yeah. All right, so mm -hmm. it's over, I, is it out? I think it is out, right? April 7th. Oh, April 7th. Okay. Yeah. Pick it up. It's fresh. Uh, Declan Shalvey uh, has a new book coming out, and FOC for it is actually on Monday called uh, Time Before Time. I Ooh. love time travel stories. This is one Same. of the, my favorite time travel stories I've ever read. I like Declan Shelby's work very much. He is very, very, very talented. But don't tell him I said that because you know, he doesn't need more. Stephen Mooney will murder me that I said something nice about Declan uh, publicly, okay? So no one's <laughs> listening to this. Don't you worry. Right. This is just you um, and me. So yeah, so those, I, I, I would say those. Uh, and um, with the book, I'm actually, I still haven't been able to, I haven't had time to read it, but um, as you can probably tell from over my shoulder, I am a, where is it? There. Uh, I'm a, a huge Nightwing fan. He's my all-time mm -hmm. favorite character. And, and, you know, I wrote his book during the New 52 mm -hmm. for, for like three years. Um, 
I'm never able to read a book or a character after I've worked on them because it's it's kind of like trying to stay it. friends with an ex girlfriend, you know. Mm-hmm. Like um, that said, uh, Tom Taylor and uh, is it is it uh, Bruno? Uh, Bruno, what is his last? You mean name? who's Dondo? who's doing it right no. now? Yes, the the run that just started for the Infinite Frontier run. I the, have like, those in the shop waiting for me. It's good. I haven't read it yet, but I love Tom and I just, what they're doing, like you could tell from the covers, it's like, yes, like this is the Nightwing book that I dreamed of uh, reading, but also Mm -hmm. of writing. So like, I'm ridiculously jealous of Tom, of course. Uh, He's mega talented and uh, he's gonna, you know, I think he's really, they're gonna do a really defining run on this character. And as a fan, as a writer, I'm jealous. As a fan, I'm thrilled and so excited for it. And um, yeah. so I need to actually sit down. I think the second issue came out. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, so so those are those are a few things right there, I guess. Now, uh, the last thing before I let you go, there was a story in Gizmodo that I intend to ask you about. It says Radiant Black teases a big new reveal for its most mysterious foe. That's number six. It's very rare that a new series like this jumps over to sort of like a mainstream blog and teases so far in advance. Is there right. some reason, like is there something going on here that they jumped onto this so quick or was this a surprise for you or? No, there's a few reasons for it. Um, the first reason is because, the first reason is because it's a very special issue. Um, it's also an issue that is <laughs> it's an issue that will m- the significance will make even more sense once issue four comes out. So I basically have to stay Addition- alive until August. Yes. Additionally, though, well, no, six is out in July. I, I don't get my comics for a while. I got some lag, okay. you know. Well, but that's also the reason, that's the other reason, is that um, solicits for July will be coming out in a matter of days. So we better. And, um, you know, it's kind of, there's a little bit, well, oh, this, is a, this is a little bit of a peek behind the curtain. Um, sometimes uh, multiple pieces of news, actually oftentimes multiple pieces of news uh, tend to, uh, you know, devour each other, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so there, maybe there, maybe, maybe the, with how special issue six is and the, and the guest creative team that's joining, I mean, David LaFuente is one of my all-time favorite artists. Uh, Cherish Chen, who is um, a newer comics writer, um, has really, really blown me away. And uh, Miquel, uh, Mikel uh, Muerto, who's coloring, again, one of my favorite colorists in the industry, we wanted to make sure that the announcement of this very special issue um, got its kind of space to breathe um, before uh, before the July solicits come out. Well, you got me hungry for it. I'm, Good. I'm, I'm <laughs> FOC, FOC calls. Uh, listen, thank you so much, Kyle. Everybody, if you want to follow Kyle on Twitter, he's Kyle D. Higgins. Yep. I made the mistake of looking for you and not putting the D in, but I found it. And you I'm always got to add the up. D. Yep. <laughs> Good advice in life. Uh, well, I'm mean, following you on Twitter. My, when it comes to my Twitter, apparently, like there's <laughs> there's a lot of Kyle. There's some Kyle Higgins out there that uh, uh, yeah. they've. One guy was like, "I should just sell you. Uh, I should just sell you my oh. Twitter handle because I guess he kept getting tagged." Um, but uh, on principle, I, I don't want to I don't want to do it. <laughs> well, go follow, follow Kyle D. Higgins on Twitter. I just did it. I'm the lab coat guy on Twitter. We're going to find out from Kyle what's going on in three this yep. next week. We're finding out what's going to happen in four soon. And then we have to come back for five and six. And then probably we'll be in for the long ride after that because you're going to have us in the palm of your hands. Oh, good, good. There's um, there's a really, really we have a very uh, ambitious plan in place for, for this book. 
I'm ready so, for your uh, ambition. I have the, I have the, I'll put it this way. I have the first, I have the first 25 issues plotted. Oh, he's industrious too. I looked off camera. Sorry, everybody. That's Clint over there. Producer Clint. <laughs> Listen, Kyle, we'll let you go. Thank you so much. I hope you, uh, don't work too hard, but yeah, work too hard because we want to read the stuff you're writing. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And thank uh, you. Until next time. Yes. And this was Randall Lobb for the Cover Price Definitive Tales from the Flipside podcast. We had Kyle Higgins, creator of Radiant Black at Image. We want to thank him for having the patience to be the first person and to let us dig deep into his brain. We'll see you next time for the next interview. That's Cover Price Definitive. Tales from the flip side. It's an interview and it will be studded into the YouTube of choice soon. Take care.